present the State Board of Ed meeting of January 10th, 2012 is called to order. And the first item is the approval of State Board of Ed minutes, the regular and committee of the whole meeting of December 6th. The motion, please. So moved. Moved by Nancy. Support. Supported by Cassandra. Any changes, deletions? And the, the, the minutes that are moved are the revised minutes that we got right. here today. Mm -hmm. I will make them for you. Good on that. Okay, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Um, public participation. Looks like you already have some. I do. Um, I have two public participation forms here. Um, the first one is Kristen Bontacharo. Kristen, if you can come to the end of the table. And while Kristen is coming here, I will let you know that um, five minutes for public participation and the board does not course or interact with you um, but they will listen to whatever it is you have to say thank you thank you good afternoon I'm Kristen Fonatero I work at the School of Information at the University of Michigan go blue and I'm the author of several books on teaching and learning in school libraries I'm the daughter of two career educators and I'm proud to be here as a teacher of pre-service pre teachers and pre-service school librarians um, I'm, I, I'm here today on behalf of Wayne State University and my university um, uh, of, of the faculty, we aren't allowed to speak on, on behalf of our universities themselves, to thank you for your encouraging comments this morning about the updating of the professional education standards for the library media endorsement. We were very heartened by your comments and we are excited about moving forward. Um, we, I heard you speak about a couple of things um, today that I wanted to um, reassure you that we're working on in school libraries and one was the discussion during the, the data collection about the number of remedial courses being taught and it is a great sadness even on a campus like the University of Michigan to see the number of remedial courses being taught and one of the hidden remedial courses that is being taught over and over and is actually the largest growth in librarianship at this time is instructional librarianship to teach kids how to do research how to find great sources and how to put that information together into a quality academic paper and so for us we see it as a real key to the future success as Michigan has identified itself as a career and college readiness state that we um, have this support work going on in K-12 so that those students come to college and are successful and a librarian in Gross Point said to me that she has students come back who say they're the only students in their class who know how to do a research paper because she taught them and if we look at the large number of districts where that's not happening it is a real concern and this is something that is currently going unmeasured in MEEP is this kind of real world hit the ground able to do the college readiness work. Um, so this, that's why we come to you to talk about the power of the new kind of librarianship. Those are the kinds of skills we are very interested in developing and we are heartened to see that the Common Core State Standards do a, a great deal to help us work in that direction and we hope that um, you'll support us in having um, certified school librarians who are trained specifically in those skills to help students be ready for college. We're doing a good job getting students into college. Once they get there and there aren't standardized tests, um, they have a whole new set of skills that they need to have. Um, we are excited to say that both at Wayne State and at Michigan, we've already voluntarily aligned ourselves with the standards we've asked you to consider so that our students are ready and at Michigan, we've also worked on aligning them towards the National Board Certification so that we are sending into Michigan schools the best qualified staffers that we can. We are not in interested in book warehousing anymore. We're interested in information in all sources wherever that information is best found. Sometimes that's still print, sometimes that's people, sometimes that's digital, and sometimes that's in formats we don't know yet. And we believe passionately, and this is why we are educators of pre-service librarians, that a real key to Michigan sustainability is the idea to look at great information and make sense of that data and I think that that conversation came up earlier today when you were having a discussion about you were making this great data website and were people going to be able to pull off that data and make sense of it those are the kinds of issues that we are passionately engaged in and those are the kind of graduates we want to turn out ones that can help people make sense of this incredible data dump that we're starting to get tons of information and very little knowledge how are we going to help our students be ready for a world where data is so abundant? So there are only four school library professors in the state of Michigan now that we have two preparation programs. I'm the sole one at the University of Michigan, um, Diane Walster and Kathy Kumasi, full-time at Wayne State University, and Nancy Larson, who is the adjunct at Wayne. 
And we all stand together in saying that we are excited about moving forward. We think this is a matter of, of deep urgency for the state of Michigan. Um, many of us were born and raised here, and this is a place that really matters to us. And to see our, um, our nieces and nephews grow up and feel that the state is as vibrant as it was when we were kids. So we encourage you to move and, and help us in that work by supporting the new standards because we have great work to do and we can't wait to do it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you could bring a little more enthusiasm to this, <laughs> we would appreciate it. <laughs> Sandra York is the next speaker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to take a minute. I'm Sandra York with Michigan PTA for those who aren't aware of, of who I am. Um, uh, I'm here with my annual highlight about our reflections program. Um, something very, I think, outstanding is happening for a student of ours here in Michigan. Uh, each year, the reflections program, which uh, presents awards in six categories, uh, film production, dance choreography, literature, music interpretation, visual arts, and photography. And the way the program works is it starts at the local level and winners are sent to the state level and then we select winners that go on to national. This last year, the theme was Together We Can, and Michigan had six winners at the national level. Well, uh, starting this Friday, some of that artwork is going to dis be displayed at the U.S. Department of Education. And we have a student from Michigan whose artwork is going to be, dis to be displayed there. And it's one of um, 26 that are being displayed there, but out of 200 uh, national winners. And that student is, and I'm going to actually read it so I don't say anything um, incorrectly. Her, the theme for her uh, piece was Detroit's Homeless. It was a photography entry. Isabella Fletcher from Charles A. Lindbergh Elementary PTA in Dearborn. And so I just, I wanted to mention that um, because we hear, so, well, first of all, we hear so many terrible things that are going on everywhere, but the Reflections Art Program is an amazing program. It's over 40 years old, um, and it was started by a Colorado PTA president at the time, and it has grown and grown and grown to where there's just hundreds of thousands of entries uh, that come into national alone. That's not counting all the entries that come in throughout, you know, throughout the United States and through all of the PTA Congresses. So um, that's my little tidbit. I'm going to also be getting some information out. And I'm going to try and get a copy um, that I can forward to you of that photography piece so that you can see it. Um, that's the main thing I wanted to talk about. And, and then as a side note, and I am going to come back to you with this. I've, I've, I've mentioned before that Michigan PTA is part of National PTA's focus on the common, helping with the Common Core State Standards Initiative implementation by getting out there to the parents, to the community, and doing short presentations on what the Common Core State Standards are. And so we, we have already started that process, and we have individuals in place that can go out to schools, parent groups, and we're not looking just to present to our PTA parents. We'll go to a Kiwanis Club. We will go to a church. We'll go pretty much anywhere. There's a very nice CD that's a very short presentation that pretty much looks like it's being done like a, by a mom, and um, that can be followed up with some information and then a, a Q&A type of thing. And that disc I, I will also uh, be able to send you. It's on the National PTA website, but I can get you a copy of it or several copies of it so that you can see what it is. But it is, I think it's, the real factor is that we need to have a, it's a comfortability level that we have to bring to parents and to the community. We know what it is at this level, and a lot of parents are at that level, but even still, the information doesn't trickle down to parents the same way it trickles down to those in the education community. So um, I throw that out to you as additional things that are going on. We intend to continue doing um, work on this uh, through the time that the Common Core uh, state standards are implemented here in Michigan. We've already been working with some of the people in the department, um, letting them know what we're doing and talking to them about that. But um, I think it would be good for you to see um, the CD that I was talking about and those type of things. So that's, uh, that's where we're at right now. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Our final speaker, unless someone else has a form, is John Luff. an annual report that I put together.
minute. I was sorry I wasn't here last time. I've been sick. Don't get sick. <laughs> We're wondering. No, I apologize. Feeling better? Slightly. <laughs> well, I wasn't here on time. Uh, this is, uh, I put together this annual report with an introduction, uh, constitutional duties, uh, the emergency problem, performance record, reform of management, university situation, and uh, out of out of responsibility to fix it by Republicans and Democrats. Takes, I've spent a year up here to try and learn what's going on with uh, this education system in Michigan. You people have put in uh, long hours and a lot of time, and I uh, appreciate what's, what sacrifice that is just coming here. Uh, my personal experience, uh, I'm a rocket scientist from U of M. I served in Vietnam and worked 30 years at GM uh, solving problems. I didn't solve enough of them because the top management finished the company off. Uh, constitutional duty, general supervision of all education except universities. It's very simple. And it's very profound in Madam Strauss's court case. The judges explain the, the situation where you have the authority to manage this system of education. It's not local control. It's in the Constitution, but you're not discharging that as a board of directors. They wanted this group insulated from political uh, factors so that you only deliver one product, the best education possible for our kids. You're not doing that. And the record is very clear on that. You don't even have the respect of listing the governor who is a, a constitutionally designated member of this uh, board, his attendance on the minutes. That's intellectual integrity and it's unsatisfactory. The problem with these emergency groups is just phenomenal. 10% of them are in this category, and this Highland Park situation is just, uh, you wait until the place explodes. Uh, the kids should just be moved out of that Highland Park system and incorporated in Detroit. They have an emergency fiasco manager there. He should be able to take care of it. They got these $2 million in bonds they've run up there, supposedly fixing education. It's still the worst in the United States. And then we got this new group of educational uh, I don't know, advancement. This, this man comes down to the meeting and says, well, we're not going to work on Detroit. We're going to fix everything. And he's out of contact with what his, his restricted uh, role should be in this process. What's the performance record? Below average in the United States and Michigan. The United States is below average in uh, anything. Detroit's in, in industrial countries. And Detroit's the worst. Yet we have the top teacher salaries in the United States. So what has to be done? You have to reform the management. 800 school districts and 57 intermediate school districts. You can't manage that. There's no chain of command, span of control, basics. And then you even duplicate the tests. Michigan has their tests and you have the national tests. Just have one test and you can eliminate all those costs. In the gross point school system, they test them on the national test three times a year. The beginning of the year, a middle of the year to see how they're doing at the end to see what happened, not just one shot and we'll see what happens in a while. So gathering data is important. This university system, 13 universities and 28 community colleges, and they're not integrated and in, uh, sharing and doing effective management. And what has happened is the student loan situation has just burdened and destroyed students when they get out and they don't get a job. They get this loan, so the universities have been able to operate out of control with no responsibility of the physical management because they get this free money from these loans and the students are all stuck with this. So there has to be somebody managing this thing to help these kids out because it, it's a total uh, situation out of control. And there's 13 universities in the Constitution. The University of Michigan has come up with its gimmick to create two more universities. And that's, uh, they're just campuses, not universities. They even have the uh, temerity to turn in a separate budget to the uh, Department of uh, Budget, where the C this uh, CPA guy is running the show. He can't even manage that. The, uh, we're getting to the end here, but uh, university prep, that's the big goal, university prep. Well, why don't we start with high school prep? Let's get kids ready to go to high school. And when you have 30,000 dropouts a year, this should be integrated with the 
welfare system so that there's some involvement here so that there's supervision. These welfare people, uh, that are, whatever their involvement is, can help uh, ensure that at least that segment is, is not uh, falling into this category. But that, that's a total mess. Republicans. The, the goal of Republicans, as you think of it, is you know, better value for tax revenue. I don't see anybody talking about the, you know, improving the value, reforming this performance of this educational system. The Democrats, they want to provide people with better government services, uh, which are, they're both great goals, but the, the Democrats here have the majority of this group, so you could be setting the agenda for this and do this. This charter school thing is just another example of out of control, you know, expanding that when the, the people that need the help are the people that have the most needs at the bottom of the, the equation. And this diversion of money into this other system is just, uh, you know, under capacity for the existing public school system. It just is undermining this whole system. So that's a summary of one year's uh, analysis in five seconds. Please fix it, and we'll hope this 12 is a better year. Thank you. <laughs> President's report, John. Uh, we, we may surprise people by being on time today, so I, I assume if there's any other publics that emerge, we'll allow space for them at some point. We would, but just, just uh, we reported this about a year ago, but it's been a long tradition, so we would still accommodate 1.30, but we changed the sheets and the policy at okay. 1 o'clock. Oh, good. So that people, obviously, if someone came in, we'd make it work. But we, we got to a point where we realized, since we were starting to do one o'clock anyway, let's just formally make it one o'clock and let people know. So I think we're good. But good. I just the order of this blue sheet was still out of order. Yeah, you know what? That, that's a good point. It just tricked me a little bit. So I hope we weren't. Um, anyway, any publics we definitely want to hear from, and thank you for being here. Uh, just a couple things briefly. I one. I thought it was um, timely, and I want to thank the board. Our work last month where we unanimously approved um, some recommendations for budget priorities. Uh, we talked about it a bit informally at lunch. We do have a budget surplus, uh, thankfully, and I think it was uh, helpful. The governor's budget director I saw was quoted as saying, now that we've stabilized the FISC, where do we strategically invest uh, resources, modest surplus? Uh, and I, again, commend the governor and his and all of our attention to these education priorities. Uh, teachers, any time, any place learning, uh, dealing with the common core college readiness standards, rewarding schools to show achievement. And I would personally add uh, early childhood, uh, which is stated here, rather generically, pre-K, K, and higher ed, to those important investment priorities. So I really want to thank the board and reinforce um, the importance of us strategically investing. We've made a lot of reforms. We've consolidated early childhood. We have great leadership here. We have uh, made teacher tenure reform. It's, it's time to support uh, educators with investment in those reform systems. Um, the other piece of work that we did last time was approve a process for taking a comprehensive look at our education funding system, and uh, I am eager for us to do that. We need to identify outside department, outside resources to support the kind of rigorous help that we will need, and so uh, we are working on that. Don't have anything to report, but I, I will continue to try to help us advance on that with whatever help uh, we can get to take that kind of hard look, and we'll report more on that um, next month or in the future. I guess the last thing, and, and we can talk about it a bit more under the legislative report, you know, the big action on expanding charters and choice that did pass, I think, it passed after our last meeting or right before our last meeting, after our last meeting, I think. Um, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, I'm a charter advocate. I believe, it, and a choice advocate, I believe it's important to provide quality choices and expanded choices where we're not seeing achievement. I'm concerned, and I guess I'm a little disappointed with what finally passed. Um, this is me talking just personally. I think it, we were very close to having a very strong bill that uh, focused on expanding quality new charters and put some quality conditions in that 
put emphasis on those that expansion where we need them the most, where we're not seeing achievement in our conventional schools. Part of why I raised this morning, we are closing down and we need to continue to close down poor quality regular schools. Um, and I am hoping that as we move ahead, we'll continue to put a lot of attention on what is happening uh, with this expanded charter choice. I am probably for the first time concerned that we'll get more school startups that are not of quality or taking us where we need to go that are taking resources from schools that will face bigger financial challenges than they would have faced otherwise and that will see more uh, distress, uh, which is not what we want. Uh, I am concerned we need to see more charter high schools uh, which are more expensive and I'm concerned about the conventional school system holding the bag for educating high schoolers. Uh, and so we need to challenge the charter expansion community to develop quality high schools and to develop quality schools period just as we need to be serious about challenging the conventional schools to improve quality and we need to treat them all the same. I will herald the accountability, transparency and, and pr those provisions in the bill. I think we, we did see some advance in um, insisting on common treatment, everybody takes the same assessments, everybody's part of the accountability regime, that is all to the good. And others on the board and beyond have their own perspectives and diverse perspectives on this topic and, um, and better informed perspectives than my own. And so I welcome healthy attention at the board and Mike and the department to see how we can bird dog this expanded charter choice regime thoughtfully and constructively. Thanks, John. <coughs> This is my report. You know, just a quick add-on to that. I think what, looking at myschooldata.org today, it, you can envision how, even though we didn't get ideally what we might have wanted in that bill, we can provide tools that people can make their own quality assessments. And um, I think this is a long way with what, towards that goal with what we saw this morning. So people can make choices for themselves that are because it is the worst nightmare if people are making choices that really aren't in the interest of their kids just because they're, they're, not, uh, they're not given the right access to the right kind of measures. So myschooldata.org today I thought was a fantastic start. Um, I wanted to just kind of briefly, this is an ongoing process, as you know, right up to ultimate kind of negotiations with the, with the feds. But last month we gave a pretty extensive report on the ESA waiver issue and, and I think what we feel good about, we've worked on it pretty intensely. I'd say every week we've had some intense meetings on this, got some more feedback from the board, uh, a couple of board members after the, after the board meeting last month. And I think I wanted to at least address what we've, I think we've rectified uh, not only in our own thinking but I think it, it, it fits very well with the conversation here at the board meeting and that is that we've, we've, we've altered this to the degree that um, the 85% issue that we talked about would be across the board uh, for all nine subgroups. Uh, and that was an issue that I think got appropriate conversation then and we realized that if we didn't do that, buried in the 15% could be a given subgroup. And in addition, we've added, uh, I think we had this at the last session, but a, the, 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 kind of the bottom 30% would be a tenth subgroup. And I, I think what that will finally get at is some other issues that I was superintendent in a district that still never would have been able to understand their issues with just the nine subgroups would have understood new issues with the bottom 30%. You can think of that, where they, they might not fit in a subgroup, but the bottom 30% being a separate entity helps us diagnose that differently. This is, um, by the way, this is still, we've got another stakeholder group meeting. Um, I, I sat in on a conference call we were invited to, so I, I didn't feel like I was uh, eavesdropping, but it was with my counterparts who signed, you know, this is a superintendent's signature, and I wanted to kind of hear what they were thinking about, the ones who applied the first time. And I heard everything from, I guess I probably should mention the states, but one state that felt they were dealt with fairly and got some feedback about what they had to change, and if they didn't, they wouldn't be approved, and they think they can accommodate that. Uh, another state that I think was uh, perhaps properly militant but said that's it, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not doing what's suggested uh, even if it means that uh, all the schools meet this other old AYP 100% by now test. So I'm, 
I'm, I'm reading between the lines, and until we have ours in, if you remember, this whole process is to get to yes. It's not, it's not to get a yes or a no from the department. But having said that, it didn't occur to me that it's really not get to yes if it turns out that maybe their uh, concerns are something that might be uh, not meet with where our discussion's been. I don't necessarily anticipate that, but I just, it was a new observation for me. I, to me, I think one of the things that really got strong in our more recent meetings on this as a superintendent's group is, 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 is I think we found it, is this blend of uh, ambitious and attainable. You know, and, and I think the 85% does that. It's still ambitious, but it's attainable. It's a little bit, uh, I think we've solved it with the thinking that went on at the board meeting last time about making sure that was, a, the inference making sure that was across the board for all subgroups. But it's still a little bit awkward that, so we're not saying 100% of the kids should be there. You know, there's there's still that tension a little bit. But I think it, I think the way at least I have resolved it in my own mind was the idea that uh, that that's that's the tension that is built into this about ambitious but attainable. And I, and I think in a way the other advantage of the 85% certainly doesn't mean we don't look to it to be 100% either by that time or certainly down the road past it. But I think it also gets us past the, I'm not even finding fault with this, so I got to watch how I say it, but if you're in the field, and I, it takes me time to remember being there, so I, that's why I appreciate the suggestion years ago to get into buildings and do some of that is helpful. But in trying to think back, you can almost in, unintentionally give excuses for not having growth if you set something that people believe is unattainable. It's almost you're out. So I think that discussion really helped us. We, we met the next day on it after the board meeting and felt like that seemed like a good kind of resolution was the 85%, but at every, with every subgroup and feel pretty comfortable with that at this point. We'll see what, um, you know, some of the folks that sit in the room here are, are part of uh, the, the constituents that, you know, regularly interact. I noticed I left the room yesterday at Ed Alliance when I met with them because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be part of their discussion on what they're ready to bring, you know, continue to bring to the, uh, um, the stakeholder Party. meeting. <laughs> yeah. And, and so they'd feel, com I mean, I think they're pretty comfortable with it, but feel totally comfortable. And, and then we'll make the February deadline and we'll see what kind of feedback we get. Um, we have, Sally's uh, done a great job with her team and her leadership in disaggregating the uh, applications that are in and what went well and what didn't. We have an insider, I guess I would say, who used to work here, who's one of the I thought Ed Raber is one of the reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you know, we're trying to learn. Is that good or bad? He knows this too well? <laughs> <laughs> they probably Worked don't. I, I'm guessing they, I don't know, but I'm guessing they wouldn't let him be a reviewer for us specifically. But, uh, but the insights are helpful. So I, I, I feel like the discussion last month was very helpful. Um, it's kind of a living document in a sense, and I certainly would bring to you if we thought that we got uh, feedback from the feds that was maybe not where we'd want to be. Um, I, I don't mean, again, I don't want to, I'm not anticipating that, truly not, but when I saw the one be pretty militant about, well, that's it then, we're done. <clears throat> I thought we were done, so now 100% of your schools, they were supposed to have made 100% this year, where are you going now? But I think he felt like um, that his particular reviewers, I don't think he would attribute this to the secretary, but to his reviewers were strong arming uh, an agenda in effect that he didn't uh, support. I didn't hear that from any of the others. So maybe we'll know more about that. Ed Week seems to disclose a fair amount. Uh, we continue to have calls. I'm looking at Sally because we continue to have calls with those that are in this process. Um, I, I, did, I do think it's fair to say that CCSSO that, that uh, coordinated the call, um, <coughs> at least one of the staff members felt that states haven't been 
treated with equity on this. And uh, well, with equity, and what I, I think what I mean by that is they felt like some of this is who you get to review. You know, it's almost like our discussion earlier about the learning, early child learning grant. We had 20, 20, 20, 20, and then a 12 from one reviewer, and they don't throw out the high and the low. Like, you know, so there's, there's always that bit of attention. But we're plugging along, and I think, uh, as I said, I think it was real helpful. I don't know that we would have gotten to this 85% that seemed like to be kind of a consensus of the board last month, as long as we did it with subgroups, and I don't know if you're still comfortable with that. If, can we ask questions? Sure. I don't want to ask. Sure. Um, I, I did see the what other states were throwing in there, and I just wanted to reassure myself. Sorry, I saw. I did see some descriptions in Ed Week about all the different approaches, which are all over the map. States are taking some only looking at math and um, uh, reading. If uh, your all's presentation last time seemed to suggest, and I hope it's true, we're including math, reading, science, social studies, writing, graduation rate. Is that true? Okay, good. I just wanted to reassure myself on that point when I saw what some other states are doing. Yeah. Dan, thanks. Uh, so I don't want this to come across as backslapping, but I'm, I'm really pleased, though, um, with the direction that we're taking, uh, maintaining subgroups. I think it, uh, a little more work for uh, you guys, perhaps, um, uh, but I, I as I expressed last month, was just really concerned about who would be in the 15 percent. Um, uh, and so I think it's great that we're going to maintain subgroups. And I think it's great that we will do bottom 30 percent for those uh, other schools um, that don't have some of those subgroups um, so that they do have a subgroup, um, uh, so to speak. I think it puts everybody uh, in the same boat uh, and creates an environment in Michigan where um, everyone has a stake in, um, in figuring out um, uh, how to improve the educational performance of the students who are most in need of it. So I think that's, that's I'm just really pleased with the direction that we're going. With that, yes, please. Uh, my concern last week was about um, making sure that students with special needs were being treated fairly in the assessments. Mm -hmm. Have you guys addressed that? Or how have you addressed that? Um, let me just... <laughs> 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 Superintendent for a day. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a continuum of, of assessments for students with disabilities. It goes all the way from MEEP to MEEP with accommodations to MEEP access to my access, three levels of my access, different levels for the different, different cognitive functioning levels of the students. So we have, we have a, actually we have more of a, a range of um, assessments for students with disabilities in any other state to make sure that we, we are never giving an assessment to a student where there is not a reasonable expectation of proficiency given good instruction. Um, there are some other places where there's just one big assessment for students, one alternate assessment for students with disabilities and covers a huge range. Um, in those states, some parents are just told your student will never be proficient on this because it wasn't targeted to that student's level of cognitive functioning. Because we do have um, that broad array to, to target multiple levels of cognitive functioning, um, we actually don't have to say to the parents, well, we, you will never, we would never expect that your student would be um, uh, proficient on this assessment. We can, we can honestly say that there will always be a reasonable expectation of proficiency given appropriate instruction for every student. And I'm assuming that we are shying away from what uh, NCLB did in that limiting the percentage of students who can be um, classified as special needs. Uh, that's that's a good question. I, do, I don't know whether or not the federal government would be flexible on that. Um, they've been pretty clear on on where they're being flexible, and that was not one of the uh, areas of flexibility um, because of a lot of the um, special interest groups that really do not want to have that happen. And, and in particular, it, it, it tends to actually be the advocates for students with disabilities right. that don't want that to happen. Vanessa and Joseph, uh, to say the least, I appreciate you recognizing it, but it worked a, you know, with Sally's leadership, but have done a great job on this, and um, we'll continue to work on it. You know, and it, I think you just heard kind of a tip, which is it might be that part I'm talking about in another state where they this, the, the, that there won't be flexibility in a given area that we may feel the need to have. Again, it's the tension compared to what. 
it's continuing with what we do have. So there's a, there is that negotiation in effect that'll go on and we'll obviously report back on, on yeah. how we feel that's going. Can I, uh, Cassandra helped me understand this last point last time that the cap on how many could be accommodated is one of the big drivers of you know, not having a, a set of boxes where people can be, be proficient. So it is, that's a huge issue and I was looking, as you know, in my comments, is there some way we can keep proficiency expectations high while recognizing what Cassandra and you all have been working on, that proficiency may mean different things legitimately for uh, some young people. So that's a tough one. So. It's true that the federal guidelines currently for AYP require that you can um, count one percent of your proficient scores um, from my access from the um, alternate assessment and then two percent from our modified assessment. But even within that, again, this is, forget flexibility for a minute, this is just right now. There's also the ability for districts to apply for what's called a one percent exception waiver, which means all you have to do in the spring is tell us we have a reason that we're assessing more than 1% of our kids with my access, and it's a legit reason, and here's some documentation. We approve your application, and then if you fail to make AYP on your special ed subgroup, um, we can start uncapping proficiency scores so that you make the target. Um, we have to balance because we can only use 1% of our total statewide population, but in general, if districts have applied for their 1% waiver, most districts usually, if they have kids who've tested proficient on the My Access, that's also the trick, and those scores haven't been counted yet, most of the time we're able to count those scores if they have taken the steps. So, so again, that's minus flexibility just right now the way it is, and we really are encouraging districts to make sure they have that waiver application on file um, and to assess their kids with the appropriate assessment because we've noticed a lot of districts shying away from the My Access assessment for that reason. Okay. So more to come. That's our my my <laughs> state of the report at this at this moment in time. Um, by the way, in the Flanagan clan tradition of uh, one grandchild a month, uh, <laughs> <there's another laughs> that, that's Will, and Will's um, he's. Popping along there. I mean, it's it, it is interesting that it's colliding kind of all at once. It's We've true got about the iris. This is how you all do it, right? Well, we one do. a month. And we do one. Right. Soon you <laughs> outnumber not the everybody. Same, not the same daughter-in-law. <laughs> this, this is another family, but uh, great addition for uh, particularly during the season. We just we just uh, so we have two newborns really with Avery that I think I showed a photo of last month, and then Will today. Lovely woman. Lovely woman. Yeah. Yes, yeah, my wife Anna is uh, very. Yeah. Very happy. Actually, I told her, yeah, one time I, I actually told her age, and she was fine with it because she looks a lot younger than she is, which yeah. is much to her credit. Um, and then I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Benton Harbor. I, I think, in the spirit of what's happening and potentially happening in Highland Park, as was referenced today, uh, although that's still a governor's call, it's in his court. Uh, We'll see how that proceeds. I think it's it's also good to call to attention a district that, to my surprise, um, really stepped up and, and took control of their own destiny on this. They did it as a, a labor management board, superintendent, they all worked on it, um, and, and then submitted a plan that uh, it was a little awkward because I think there were some expectations in some circles that well for sure there's going to be an emergency manager in Benton Harbor and I think it was it showed our if I can it's a little self-serving but it showed our authenticity about this which is if you take care of your own stuff that's the preferable model and they did and they're back on track and, it, and it'll you know we'll, we'll continue to monitor as we do other deficit districts but I thought it was a really good given if you recall that we started with a financial review there, which often leads people to think, well, if we started the financial review, it's going to end up with an EM. And it didn't in that case. And uh, whether you're in favor of the law or not, one of the advantages, I would say, is that it, 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 sharpens, the, it sharpens the conversation in the district between all parties. Because I, 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 I hope that can and will happen with you know, other districts 
um, as we go. And then ultimately there's some other issues, I think, to solve the bigger problem so that we don't just have this continuing array that uh, our own group's going to talk about more on Friday. And uh, I'm ready to give this to someone. I'm still on. What am I? <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. Well, Madison did what Benton Harbor did, and they eventually resolved their own issue. Yeah, but it was after many years. Well, I wasn't here many years, you know. I, I but on my watch, when this PA72 came into effect, and we started to monitor this, we we in fact I think they were were they before Detroit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, our, ironically, I know it's it's even lost in my own history as you see me trying to recollect it. But the very first district that we that we attended to and said we had every intention of moving the process and that was under PA 72 which gave a lot more authority to the state superintendent than the current one does and you know my daughter even called me from down in that area where she sees TV and it was it, there was some tough sledding about who does this person think he is and everything but I just feel that to their credit they did what they needed to do you're probably right we shouldn't have had it ongoing for 15 years, but that was the beginning of saying to the 40 or so that we have and on this deficit thing right now that Dan and Glenda and Car under Carol's leadership are working with daily is, uh, is it made it more serious that you need to take care of this. And, and Madison Heights was the first one under the gun, they did. Detroit, as you recall, I mean, we thought everything was fine until the meeting here with the board and basically said they didn't plan to implement the deficit elimination plan said that openly to us so that started that process under PA4 new law I have limited I'm happy <laughs> that I've limited uh, authority there but what we what we've done there's actually only two um, Muskegon Heights that requested it and Highland Park which is is of the 40 it's it's it, it doesn't have a viable plan Benton Harbor, as I just said, took care of business, they deserve a lot of credit. So there's really only one outstanding other than Muskegon Heights, which requested it, and that's Highland Park. And, but I do, I mean, I do, I certainly understand the issue that you're increasing the chances, particularly in a state like this where we're, compared to where I grew up, we're just more segregated. And so cities that have some of the economic burdens that urban America has in this state, there's, there's more of that. But I, I, just for the history of it, it was Muskegon Heights, I'm sorry, it was Madison Heights first, Detroit. It is a bigger problem that I, I, I was kind of alluding to it, that we're coincidentally have an agenda item on it Friday to try to think through what are, what's the larger resolution to this? Is there, I'm just, this is just, I don't know that I just, in fact, I won't say this. <laughs> I forgot you guys are back. But there's, a, there's, some, there's some strategies I think we could think of by backing up and, and not just waiting for one after another. And uh, it's not our role, technically. Our role is to monitor this, and then if they don't have an approvable plan to start the process. But I, I guess, the, I mean, I really think overall this is a... I'm sorry? 
Well, the 40, we, you know, all of these we've been working with since Madison Heights. They, 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 and you'd have more on the bubble right now if they weren't stepping up and doing what, they're, what they've been required to do. And more often than not, I, in fact, I don't know that I've turned down a request where I, I have the authority to move it from a two-year to a five-year plan. So I think every case where they've requested that, we have. So, I mean, the universe is 40. Some would say growing. I would say not so, given on the state turnaround. I, I think we're stabilizing at the 40. Uh, and, and, and watching those, so 38 of them are doing just fine, including now Benton Harbor again. And Muskegon Heights, by their own request, wants to be considered. And the only one that of the 40 that's not doing fine is, is Highland Park. But I get. I mean, I, I understand the bigger I issues. There are other ways of dealing with this. I mean, the economics of the situation, the economy has hit these places hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and well, you know, I, I don't want to. There might be some mismanagement. I'm not saying it wasn't mismanagement or incompetence or something. But the economy has really changed so much that yeah. it's really hurt them so much. I mean, some of this, as you know, is just not discretionary. They, 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 we, we're not the federal government, and they have to have a balanced budget over time and take care of the deficit. I, I would say this, in a way now I may be taking away the compliment I just gave Ben Harbor, but I don't think so. It, they did it. But if you disaggregate the data on Benton Harbor, they hadn't done some of the very key things that other districts, not just other urban, urban districts did, but other rich districts did, which is, for instance, I'm, and I'm not valuing this one way or the other, but given that of the people who have health insurance in this state, and many do not, as you know, but of those that have health insurance, the average is 27 percent on a, on a copay on the premium. Theirs had been at zero. Most districts are now at 10 or 20. This isn't, you know, in the good times, zero is great. You know, we want employees, we want to recruit people to the profession. But what I'm getting at is, is that's something Benton Harbor could remedy and did. They remedied it by taking action to share in the premium cost, and I think it was about $18,000 a, 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 an employee. So it adds up quickly when, so I would use that as an example that has nothing to do with urban, poor, suburban, that we're in a different world where, as I said, 27% of the people who have, even have health insurance are paying are, uh, uh, no, I take that back, are paying 27%. Those who have health insurance are paying 27% of their premium. And so that's an example that was outside of their poverty. And to their credit, I, I give tremendous credit to the, to the union, the labor group there, because it, it is hard to um, work with folks who are your members to understand what's changed. And, uh, were there other options? Um, I don't want to cite that as their only, that wasn't their only, that's just an example of one that to me needed to happen given it's happened in virtually every other district. And the reason this didn't, this, this was in addition to the law, because as you know, the law now requires the 20 percent, but that's after your contract's over, that when your contract expires. So this was still kudos to Benton Harbor because they didn't have to do that for another few years. So I, I, but I, I, I do get the part of the report. I just would say that we're, we're really down to one other than Muskegon Heights, which requested it. Benton Harbor did a great job. The other 38 are continuing to do a great job in getting their own issues resolved. Sometimes it's going to take them five years to do it. I have mine. And then, yes, Dan. No, please. Is that all right? Sure. All right. Um, uh, Three quick thoughts on this. One is, um, so three quick thoughts on this. One is, uh, I just want to commend Kathy your courage in raising the issue. Um, whether uh, uh, correct or not, I think is um, kind of a, a second issue. But um, uh, the truth of the matter is that um, we have a long history in this country of kind of the unfair application of law on the basis of race. Um, and uh, despite, you know, what, what we all would want to believe, um, it persists today. Uh, uh, and so uh, I really respect the fact that you would raise the issue um, in this forum and force all of us to confront it. 
um, I think that's absolutely the right thing to do, whether um, the law is actually being applied fairly or not. Um, so thank you for that. Um, second, um, I, so I would, um, I, I think I would, so I would take this in a slightly different direction um, uh, than the application of this particular law, just to, I think, acknowledge, and I, I don't know how we do this at this table, but to acknowledge that in the world, so the world of education doesn't exist in a vacuum, uh, and we are regrettably um, charged with supervision of an education system that is wildly segregated, uh, not unlike the rest of our state, right, housing patterns and the like. Um, and the impact that that has on our education system and the quality of education that our kids receive, all of them receive, frankly, is, is negative. Um, and I would hope at some level, in some way, um, whether through policy or mere bully pulpit, we would take on the challenge of, of, of challenging Michiganders to be better about that. All of us can be better about that. Um, the housing, just the, <laughs> those patterns in this state are despicable and horribly, dis it should be horribly disappointing to all of us. Thanks, Dan. And then finally, I just wanted to end on a good news point. Marty sent out a really thoughtful, well uh, worded uh, press release on this because we wanted to kind of give credit to Justice Division for, again, getting out before uh, uh, school break the, the MEEP results. Um, we still, the reason we took the tack of trying to get some publicity about this is because for any number of reasons that I'm not clear on, the teachers don't always get it. And then we're in a bit of a defensive posture about, well, they're out there. I don't know why either your testing coordinator or your principal or whatever hasn't. They may have good reason not to do that, but it's not because the department hasn't Replay, hasn't released them, that's all. And, I, and I, they really, if you look at, if we were measured by this, I know this is kind of a metric-oriented uh, state right now, if we were measured by this, this would be a gigantic victory because it's come down from what legitimately was a concern a few years ago to, to a very short turnaround. And then, of course, in 14, with the smarter balance and getting technology infrastructure in place, I think we'll do even better. But I wanted to give a shout out to Joseph and his crew. And then maybe because uh, I'll just recommit to kind of to Dan's point along with Kathy's that I wouldn't say coincidentally, but I guess coincidentally we have a major item that we're discussing this very thing on Friday to try to look at different solutions um, and not just be the one that the law requires to do. I would say this on behalf of the law. As I said, it's working for 38 of the 40. And large, most of those, as you're inferring, are still largely districts uh, that that it's a majority minority. Um, you could. I'm not saying this is the resolution, but you know there are states that don't have this problem because, uh, let's say, Florida, Tampa Bay kids are all in the same district as suburban kids, and and it's not. You, you, you start to change that dynamic when you have a bigger county system in that case, which has other pros and cons, but you, you, you as a board of that entity have a different relationship with your constituents than if you had 15 boards in that area and some with just segregated groups. So I mean, I, to me, that's always been something worth at least considering in some way to try to change the dynamic of how we it, it, it could be done overnight, theoretically, and then you've changed that whole dynamic that Dan's talking about, because they don't have that in Florida, you're, uh, as an example, they don't have it in, in particularly the, the states that use counties. One possible solution. So, I'll probably shorten my report next time, <laughs> but I think these are healthy, good, mm -hmm. good discussion. Nancy, please. I, I just wanted to apologize to everyone. I have to leave our son is leaving to go home and I'm his chauffeur. Okay. And I have to get him to the airport, so I look forward to seeing everyone next time. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Paul, you're up. Thank you. Rush it. Nancy's walking out the door. All right. I will leave it. I promise. Yeah, thank you. Um, as uh, December was for all of us, a very busy month, uh, was for myself as well. A lot of different things, as was in the report. I just want to hit a couple highlights. Uh, one was the um, 
collaboration that's happening at uh, the technical campus um, in Royal Oak, the WAY program, Widening Advancement for Youth, uh, is at our campus. And it's a program that's traditionally, uh, per it's personalized learning experience for students uh, who struggle uh, within the traditional high school setting. And uh, it's project-based learning, much like career and technical education is. And so the partnership is, uh, is forming. And uh, my role so far is to say, okay, well, what can we do with projects in, uh, on the uh, curriculum that these students are working through that could lead to some of these national certifications that are currently offered within uh, the Business Management, Marketing, and Technology program, which I teach in. And uh, we, we decided to have collaboration around curriculum dealing with uh, national certification in customer service and in sales. So, so many of the projects and the things that they are working on, that's an underlying theme that works in any profession uh, when we look at uh, dealing with customer service and working with people and then also the sales part. So that's going to be an ongoing project that we're going to work with, and I think it's going to be very beneficial for us, but also beneficial for those students who then now we have a broader range of students who can have access to those national certifications. And that was the first starting point, and so that certainly is one that could be across many different career options uh, within career and technical ed. Um, also continue to have the opportunity to speak with high school students and uh, as I'm working and we're learning and doing this, I was at Southfield Lathrop High School explaining to the students as they were finalizing their uh, two year or one year remaining of uh, their high school planning to consider uh, some of the career and technical education options that are available uh, through CTE at the technical campus and again just spreading the word and letting them know what is available to them and I think Thus, the year thus far has uh, really been uh, the piece there of letting people know that education piece of the spectrum is very, very viable for many, many different types of students. And uh, that certainly was an opportunity uh, for me to do that as well. Um, as you know, and in some of my other reports, uh, America's Marketing High School, uh, we are very uh, active throughout the year and um, we provide free online uh, curriculum for business, marketing, sports and entertainment and entrepreneurship, but uh, kind of our flagship, if you will, or the cornerstone is um, as we head into February and the Super Bowl, we do an entire uh, program around the Super Bowl and we have curriculum that deals with everything from the socioeconomic impact of the Super Bowl for a host city uh, to um, our famous Super Bowl adflation chart. Uh, when you take a look at uh, what an ad cost in 1967, a mere $40,000 for 30 seconds, and uh, this year's ad's going to be 3.5 million. That's a multiplier of 87.5. And so we have some fun with what the wages were in 67, what they are currently, and now what they would be with that adflation chart. And um, so we have a website. Um, what would a teacher like you be making with that multiplier? Uh, well, <laughs> from a standpoint, we would all be making well over a hundred and some dollars per hour when you just take the multiplier of the, of the uh, minimum wage of $7.25. So when you, when you factor all of those in there. So the kids have a lot of fun. Of course, everybody wants to make that amount of money, mm -hmm. but then your, your car costs over $400,000 too. So <laughs> it's, it's all relative, uh, you know, with that. So what I... What I'd like to do is just, just share with you briefly here, this is the uh, website, and this program that we're, uh, that we're talking about, America's Marketing High School, is, is a uh, free program for um, teachers and students um, across the country. So americasmarketingheighschool.org, we have all the resources here, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to log in and walk you through all of them, but I just want to show you the different modules that we have uh, that are here, particularly with the Super Bowl. And, and uh, um, these are the topics that come with uh, vodcast and uh, materials that are available for teachers, uh, that uh, teacher resource guides that uh, we work with and students are able to work through, and then we... Uh, culminate in the uh, ad tutorial, which we train them there on module 11 to uh, look what, what's a successful ad, what works, what doesn't. And students across the country then on Super Bowl Sunday rate the ads and then log on to our website, americasmarketinghighschool.org, and they input their results. So we have students from California, from Midwest, out east. And then we go down to the University of Detroit Mercy on typical water cooler Monday when everybody's talking about the ads. And we reveal the results of what the high school students said were the best and worst ads compared to USA Today's ad meter. And um, what we also do is break it down by gender, but we break it down by web, 
Are they going to the web to learn about it? But more importantly, we started last year tracking social media. Have you been engaged before, during, or after the Super Bowl regarding uh, uh, social media for those different commercials? So it's a, it's a great project. And about 200, 250 Metropolitan Detroit students end up on the campus of University of Detroit Mercy, where the beginning day is spent with campus and programs and lectures from professors and guest speakers on social media, a tour of the campus, and then we have our press party, which is streamed live. So if anybody's interested on that Monday from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we've partnered with uh, MI StreamNet uh, and uh, Wayne Risa to provide that. And then, of course, it's also housed there, so the year after year, the uh, results are available. So that's our big thing, our big push that will happen in early February, and uh, I'll be able to give you a report uh, as to where it came out. Uh, Chrysler has already uh, put their parameters around it that they're not going to be able, although they're working very hard, to top last year's two-minute Chrysler M&M ad. So yeah. with that being the case, um, they're, they're moving forward as well. Uh, a couple things uh, also that I was able to be a part of, and I think it's great, uh, the School Improvement uh, Conference. I was able to uh, present there, and we had a topic of en engage, excite, and embrace, and that's a common theme. We certainly need to have our young people engaged in their, uh, in their education, and uh, Barb Fardell uh, organized that group, and uh, we had a great, uh, a great conversation of how we're going to use technology and digital delivery to increase student learning and uh, help uh, with at-risk students by re-engaging them within their education. Um, I also was able to attend the Governor's Council on Educator Effectiveness, the very first meeting that was there. Uh, I thought it was very appropriate. They did allow uh, everyone to come up and speak, share their views. It was well run. People felt that they had at least a voice uh, at that meeting. That was my perspective of it. Um, and then, obviously, uh, they've got a lot of work and a lot of things that they have to do. And, and consider to uh, meet their task. And uh, so I think it was off to a good start. They have a lot of things that they have to consider and weigh, and uh, certainly a big challenge for them. Uh, the Network of Michigan Educators meeting, we had, uh, were very uh, fortunate to be hosted by Steelcase at their university. So we met uh, in December, and uh, you know we really focused on that group. It's an amazing group of uh, educators, and that was my first meeting with them. And so you have uh, National Board Certified Teachers, Teachers of the Year, uh, various uh, award winners that are members of that organization. And uh, the, the focus, and I think this is point on, you know, what does a teacher leader look like in the state of Michigan? And that's something that I'm very interested in as we continue to move forward. And then, you know, what role would a network of excellent and passionate educators play in shaping and teaching learning today. I think that's important. And then we set a priority. What is it that we want to do and accomplish within our next year before our next conference? And so that uh, was a great opportunity for it. I also had an opportunity to speak uh, to the Oakland Schools Education Foundation Board. Uh, L. Brooks Patterson um, is the chair of that foundation. And they had a meeting and hosted it at uh, my campus. We were very pleased that they chose uh, our site to meet. and. Uh, you know, really their goal is to uh, embrace and enrich learning, uh, enrich learning opportunities for students in Oakland schools and the constituent districts. And um, one of their major uh, activities is a sponsorship of the Oakland County Competitive Robotics Association, OCRA, as it's well known. And this is where young men and women compete uh, with their robotics, their technologies, their computer skills, and it's unbelievable. I was also fortunate in December to deliver the keynote to their banquet. There was over 600 young people, parents, teachers, and coaches that were at this uh, banquet, and it was phenomenal. The energy in the room was fantastic, and so the students there certainly are to be commended on their work, as well as the business partners and teachers and coaches that were there. Also, uh, what is new, and I'm very fortunate to be a part of this as well, um, the Oakland Schools Education Foundation has started a program where they are going to partner business leaders in the community uh, with teachers for an exchange program. And what they've done for this first round is select um, 12 teachers uh, that were 2010-2011 uh, nominees from out Oakland County Outstanding Teacher of the Year programs and 12 business executives. And I will be one of those 12 that will participate. We will spend time with them at their organization. They will spend time in our classroom. And then there will be an opportunity for everybody to share out uh, with that. And I think that's a great step as we look uh, at, at part of what we were saying at our lunch today. 
the business and industry, the people with uh, philanthropic uh, opportunities to help out with education to really truly have a better understanding of, um, of what's happening. And the last thing I just want to note, uh, I was able to speak with Oakland County Transition Coordinators. Uh, they had their uh, annual, annual meeting and our focus of that discussion was uh, ways and keys for the success of their students within CTE programs. And so it was a great month, a busy month, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, continuing uh, all of these opportunities that I'm afforded uh, here in 2012. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm wondering if the Super Bowl ad... If yeah, it's, it, it's and, you know, and, and that is, a, and to that point, as we've said, that is truly a situation where we have secondary education, Oakland schools, I'm representing that, post-secondary education, University of Detroit Mercy, represented by my co-founder, Professor Mike Bernacki, and business and industry, immersive engineering, uh, Chris Bien and Michael Kelly, coming together as partners to put on a project uh, of that magnitude for it. And it's, it's a lot of fun. The kids enjoy it. They're excited about it. And the nice thing about it is there are very, very many curriculum modules, vodcasts, and it's all data-based. And when we talk about learning and painting by numbers, that's what that's about, even though that we're talking about the, uh, the Super Bowl as the topic. You can tie in a lot of different uh, curriculum components, and uh, you can tie in a lot of standards that can be met uh, through that project. I predict the winner. I'm wondering if the winner of the Super Bowl ad will be whatever the satellite direct TV does. You know, now they've got, if you don't want to end up in a ditch, <laughs> you know, it's a sequence of things. If you don't want to end up in a ditch, they're not. Well, well the ad meter uh, has, has taken an increased interest. The last several years, um, some of those ads that have been the number one ad from the USA Today's ad meter, those consumer generated ad, those people earned a million dollars for being the number one rated ad on the USA Today's ad meter. So there's a little more uh, at, at stake uh, when they have some of those consumer generated ads. So very interesting topic, and, and it certainly is something the students enjoy working with. Cool. I read an article that the GoDaddy um, creator, they've made millions. Those ads have been very effective, um, as maybe um, objectionable to some as they may be. <laughs> No comment. I'm, I'm taking the bait on that one. <laughs> Lisa, I, used to like <laughs> I just think it's good that NASCAR is going to have a legitimate uh, uh, gender diversity now in their in their racing next year. A winner. Yes. Speaking of winners. Ta da. Ta da. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, rather than going through sort of updating what's in here, since most of it is, I wrote this about a month ago, um, I just wanted to talk about what's coming up because there's, yeah, it just seems like a good time to do that. Number one, welcome to an election year, um, which certainly changes the way, uh, can change the way legislators behave. MERS and Gongwer have already started doing the articles of who are the top ten most vulnerable members and uh, you know, which member is going to be pitted against who because of redistricting and that kind of thing, and that will play into, of course, the fun of... Uh, in case you want to weigh in on it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does weigh in on, on what bills are taken up and what, what are not taken up. Um, as part of the charter school bill that passed, there was language that was added to address quality, educational quality, and specifically a bicameral, bipartisan work group. Uh, Senator Pavlov is chairing it. There's eight members on it, was created, and it's supposed to have recommendations by March 30th um, on education measures to be taken to improve educational quality in all public schools for all pupils, and the work group is supposed to focus on student growth. I understand that um, they're going to start having meetings relatively quickly after um, they get rolling. The first day of session is, of course, Wednesday, and their real first week is probably the following. Um, uh, yeah, they have their constitutional start tomorrow, and I don't know that anything's being taken up. Usually it's um, more procedural and bill introductions, that kind of thing. So it'll probably be next week. 
um, or the following if they don't want to try to compete with media on the state of the state. But um, my understanding is part of the, the negotiations for getting a charter school bill and the expansion through was the promise that they would look at quality in some way, shape, or form after um, through this work group and, and uh, Cassandra. I'm just. Do you know who else is on the work group? I do. By the way, I think the board had an impact on that. I wouldn't sell yourself short on weighing in at the right time on the quality issues to uh, get this compromise, even if it's not as as, as rigorous as some may have hoped. Um, Bill Rogers. Uh, Representative Bill Rogers, Senator Bruce Caswell, Representative David Rutledge, Senator Hopgood, Representative Ken Yonker, Representative Mike Shirky, Senator Colbeck, Patrick Colbeck, and of course Senator Pavlov is chairing it. So it is, um, again, bipartisan and bicameral. There's members, it's not just from education committees. Bill Rogers is the chair of the House subcommittees on uh, K-12 expenditure, so it's a mix of finance and policy folks as well. Um, and I know that um, there's been a lot of interest in the growth, student growth at least um, in terms of they're beginning to understand that as a measurement. I know um, between the board's work on that and the departments and Joseph's, we've had many meetings with members and trying to explain what growth is. and. Um, at least that seems to be the not focus. a raw test not score, raw test one score, time right. sitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, right. that's in progress. Um, the other thing for the next few months will be remaining bills that are left over from last year. Um, the dual enrollment and shared time. I would expect that they'll they'll probably move on those. I don't know if they're going to. You had mentioned them earlier, um, Mr. Austin, and I don't know if they will address um, funding as a part of those or not. Um, but I do expect them to probably take them up again. The cyber bill, it's unclear whether they plan on just trying to keep moving with it or if that's caught up in this work group and that they won't ad really address whether or not to expand cybers until they address quality. That's unclear to me at this time. Oh, I hope you <laughs> uh, uh, in terms of priorities on, on um, leftover from last year that we the departments worked on, we had that burdensome reports package of legislation uh, that's mm -hmm. still sitting over there. The bills have not been introduced. We, um, this was in part requested by members. Ed Alliance had requested some work um, and we, we had done a lot of work internally to put together this list of suggestions of reports that we could get rid of that are duplicative or outdated uh, that local districts do in order to relieve the burden on them some. And I'm not quite sure why, but there seems to be some hesitancy by the legislature to move them, which it just to move. I'm sorry. Lisa, remind us how many reports move. were going to be consolidated based on this. I don't have an exact number, but I mean it was like 50. It was well into the double digits, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And so it's odd to me that um, a legislature Fine. that has been talking about smaller government is hesitating on on this legislation. Um, not been introduced, you said? Not been introduced, no. You, you're, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify because I didn't hear the beginning. You're talking about the reports that we had sent to them that... We had sent them a, a combined that list. That we don't need to do anymore. Yes, yes. Okay. Yep. Which is actually, so I'm sorry, just really quickly, that's actually one of the four criteria tied to the waiver request, no? Isn't that... Yes, it is. Isn't it re yes. required? Hmm. Yes. As part of the waiver request? Okay. Um, obviously accreditation is still out there and um, the last piece of course is the budget, 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 budget. We, you know, the the uh, executive recommendation is expected to come the first or second week of February. Um, I believe it starts, the education pieces start in the Senate this year, I want to, is, is my recollection. Um, they alternate every other year, but it's been different since they've been doing two-year budgets and combined budgets, and so I'm not quite sure if, if history is any teller of what's going to happen this year on that or not, but um, I would expect that will take up most of the time between now and June. Cassandra and Kat. So eight legislators are coming together to come up with recommendations on improving education quality. 
I'm assuming that they're reaching out to the Department of Education and the education community for your recommendations, and if so, what are we telling them? Um, I, I don't know that I would necessarily make that assumption, but See, I would. That's, yeah, that. Would. But but uh, I would hope that certainly. Um, I think it would be in line with everything that's been talked about previously, internally about how, um, in terms of growth measures and the growth measures we're using. I'm not quite sure. I mean, the uh, directive to the group was so broad and so. Um, really just so broad that it's hard to know exactly what they're talking about. If, if it's tied to the charter and cyber piece, are they talking about um, the ability to get involved when there's low-performing schools, in which case didn't we already do that with the school reform legislation? Are they talking about just setting some kind of standards, but we've already, the board has already done that and worked on that, so I'm, I guess I'm kind of still waiting to get some um, idea from the leadership of that committee as to where exactly they're going. Maybe. Um, sure. I mean, there's always ways that we can give them guidance. I, I think it's it's a relatively new board, a new committee, I should say, work group, um, and I'm not quite sure from the membership really, it was clear when they, decide, when they designed it that they had something in mind, that it was part of the back room, I think, negotiations of the bill, but um, from the public perspective, it's, it's a very broad thing, so I'm not quite sure how to weigh in, but I'm happy to discuss it with you further. John? But, uh, assuming it was a way to pledge to treat some quality concerns around charters stated in a broader context in return for getting the bill passed. The issue is do we as a board and the department, do we want to try to provide um, coherent uh, guidance on how to interpret that mandate and what they should be doing? Um, we you know, we made a modest run at that. We didn't get consensus. I think you know, potentially we could come to grips with a sense of direction of what we'd like them to do. Um, but that's something I think for us to figure out as a board and department together, whether we'd like to provide some guidance to them on how to interpret their work. It may be something we can look at through the legislative committee as well, which is meeting, I think, the 23rd. Yeah, if it could month. start with the legislative committee, but ultimately, I appreciate your getting on the table. There was, um, you know, there may be another effort to get consensus that would help guide See. us. That, that we just fell short of. I'm not finding fault with that. It just is what it is. So it was more broad. And, but maybe starting with the legislative committee, because I think Cassandra's on the right track, as you are, John. This is the time to weigh in. Now, some of it's going to be, I think, you know, I think Lisa's almost being too modest on behalf of Joseph and herself. They definitely get this growth stuff compared to just a raw score. That's a big growth as compared to a raw score. They start to understand the issues that are already in place that Lisa talked about, that are quality measures, you know, our metrics of top to bottom. That's a, that's a variation of a quality measure. It's well thought out. It's been, you know, we've used it now for a while. It's got a combination of number of things in it to produce the top to bottom list. So some of this is educating them on what we already have. But to John's point, I think it would be helpful if, if the legislative committee can can find common ground that we could represent the board on uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, got close but didn't quite, right? Yep. Yeah. Can and then I, I think we could do what you're suggesting. Otherwise, we're, we're hanging with some more generalized parameters. I think you've done this before, but can you send the actual language that talks about this particular work group? Yep. Because I'm not quite sure when it says measures, are we talking about actual data measures or measures as in policy? Uh, well, those right. are the actual words that I read. It's the quote, uh, education <laughs> measures to be taken to improve educational quality <laughs> in all public schools for all people. <laughs> it could be the size of education it, as it, right. it probably in means that it was in three in the morning and, and staff was tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's either data or it's policy. We don't know which one. Probably data. Or it's height and weight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In theme. I have, I'm sorry, I have one more question. 
Sure. Okay. And I should have asked this before, and so I apologize, but um, the new uh, charter school bill talks mm -hmm. about requires a petition to be signed by at least 5% rather than 15% of the electors in a school district in order to place the question of issuing a PSA or SOE contract on the ballot. In what cases would it ever go on the ballot? Um, boy, now you're making me dig back. In current law, if you wanted, if a, if a district wanted to charter something, and I believe if it had come forward as an idea from a parent, and let's say the board said nay, then they could gather petitions and say, we're kind of overriding the local board because we want to have the district charter a whatever, and this has to do with that, I believe. But oh, so but this wouldn't, be, so, th uh, because that parent would have the option of going to a university or someone like that, sure. but this is to force the hand of the district to, to charter, to charter a, a new school or to replace the school? I believe it's to charter a new school, but okay. it, I don't know that the language actually specifies, and I'd have to double check for you. And it's 5% of the electors, so it's not the people who show up and voted in the previous election. It's the actual number of people who are um, registered, registered to vote. To vote. Okay. Right. Higher threshold. Okay. Kath? That's a, a good question. It may be something we want to have Kyle or, or um, Bob Higgins address in terms of where to take the bill and go forward. I'm not sure if um, if it's just a matter of, of uh, communicating that model to the districts as, as a suggested model or if there's further work that we can do either as a department or as the board in terms of the bully pulpit. Um, I, I talked to Kyle and Bob briefly um, yesterday or Friday about if the model policy that the board adopted, if it was in any way in conflict with the law or include, you know, it's okay if it goes farther as long as it's not really in conflict is what I was kind of trying to see. And my understanding is that they're, they're fine. I mean, it's not like, um, there's no reason why a school district couldn't still use the suggested policy that the board did in order to meet the requirements of the law. Um, but beyond that, we'd probably need to check with Bill, uh, uh, Bob Higgins and Kyle Garant. Okay, we'll so that up. Did we follow up now that the law was passed? Right. We don't, should we just drop it? Right. Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, minimally, we can get it to superintendents and board presidents to, to consider for their obligation to get, a, to get one. Here's one that, that, that the state board has long considered. There's a couple of different things. One of the um, issues that was raised both by the legislative committee and by t people who testified before the committee was that when you look at the blue mitten on the district pages, which is that um, fiscal accountability data that all districts are supposed to have on their home page, that when you compared um, uh, charter schools with traditional publics, it was hard to compare because the charter schools, everything showed up under contract and you couldn't differentiate between, say, instruction and food service and um, other expenses. And so the committee came up with some language that essentially requires the management companies to report the breakdown of that data to the PSA board so that the PSA board can do that mitten the same way sort of as traditional schools in order to show a little bit more of an apples to apples comparison. So That's the um, there was also provisions added about um, what's in the contract and also not so much about transparency but accountability, the fact that authorizers have to look at student academic achievement in whether or not they're going to renew a contract or whether or not they're going to, um, well, just that, whether or not they're going to renew a contract for a particular uh, charter, they have to look at academic achievement as I think it says the most important factor. Um, 
th that's more of an accountability piece. And I think that transparency, from my own experience, would say that this is something that needs work across the board. I mean, there's contracts in traditional schools, too, that don't necessarily have um, the light of day that the citizens might expect. It does on this other issue. That's why it, it has to minimally align to these buttons. Well, Website. I mean, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, wherever it is on that button, you need to have comparability. But I'm saying the whole system probably needs more transparency when it comes to contracts and how they're awarded and what the details of them are. If I can comment just on that point, that this work group, it was very clear from the legislature that whatever they look at with quality, they want it. It's not just about charters, about that they want to make sure that we're ensuring quality yeah. sort of across the board, that we're not setting up more right. additional things that separate charters from uh, community or traditional, whatever term you want to use, schools, if, yeah. if that makes sense. I think they're trying to look at it more global, which is why they said all public schools mm -hmm. and all pupils in that language. Yeah. And it will be a, it will be as kind of Cassandra and for catching up in terms of those buttons right, right now on charter side. But on the other side, I'm just saying I think there's more transparency deserved than typically happens in any school. I shouldn't say any school district, but it doesn't have to happen in a traditional public school district either. And some offer it and some don't. I mean, there's some big contracts that are, especially as it, it's gotten more into contracting for whole things like transportation, food service, mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in effect whether it's a traditional district having a $20 million contract with a transportation provider or, or a charter school having a $2,000, you know, if anything, the proportions are higher in terms of money for traditional school districts just because they have more, you know, the ones that have more kids. So I think that whole area is ripe to have <laughs> more transparency on it and how services don't have to be bid, for instance, you know. So concrete stuff, if you, if you buy a building, you've got bids. If you buy hardware, you have bids. Services don't have to be bids. So, you know, I think that whole area, I, I don't believe there's any problems going on in particular. It's just that the, I think it would serve everyone well to have more transparency mm -hmm. on those issues. If you're, if, you're, if you're contracting with, well, I'm duplicating my example, but transportation services, that should be clear whether it's District X doing it or Charter Y doing it. And I think, in fairness to them, I think that was the spirit of finally just saying, listen, let's move on. I mean, these are all public schools. They're all on top to bottom list somewhere or other. They're all going to be held accountable under these new laws. They're all subject to PLA rules. Um, but the one that's been deficient has been transparency. And there's some catching up to do on the button part. But as I said, I think the whole system could improve on the uh, transparency of contracts. Okay. Thanks, Thank Lisa. You. Is there a, you inferred there's a legislative committee coming up then? It's established date or? No, they don't have a set date yet, but it would probably be, um, we have, oh, oh, I'm sorry, the, the state board's legislative committee. I thought you meant the legislative Yeah, I'm sorry. The 23rd. 23rd, okay, cool. Okay, consent agenda. And can I move the consent agenda? Uh, and I want to, respect Nancy's, um, in doing so, Nancy had a continuing um, concern about the professional learning policy and standards. I just promised her I'd relate, and that's that the linkage, knowing these are for professionals in the profession, that the policy and standards um, relate to their prior educational experience and that we look at that continuum. And so I will relate that concern, which she raised last time, and trusted it was addressed here. Um, and I'm sure in the spirit and the application of these standards, which we will approve, it will be perfectly addressed. Any comments, Sally, or? Uh, I think they're broad enough that they're fine. Okay. They'll be more in the guidelines. Yeah, I, I just want to make, come out, make sure. a comment about the, the uh, professional learning. I think the idea of making it uh, less wordy is a good idea. But there's, I was concerned with in what place we're talking about. It should be job and then professional relations and job. Is there a definition of that? Anything? 
what you mean by job again. I think I know, but I don't know. The, the guidance is very broad and it's not specific. And I wonder if something happens to try to do it and you're kind of using this. That when you staff to hear from each other, it's kind of going to be very effective in a lot of things. I wonder if that could be some more specific to that. And the guidance to can be sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, is there a motion? I, I move. Oh, and supported by Richard. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Any further comments by uh, the state board members? Okay. Well, um, I'm sorry? Mary, are you there? On that. Did you have a comment to make, Marianne? Oh, just wanted to make sure you got my vote. Got your vote. <laughs> Thank you for your vote. This is about where we've been typically till last month or two. Right. It's been 2.30 or 3 the last. Standard January meeting. Huh? This is the standard January It is kind of, isn't it? It's still the... Okay, well, we're adjourned. <laughs>